All right, well, thank you for all of, all of you who are staying. We're gonna have a break after this session. Um, and unfortunately, we won't answer any of those questions from the previous uh, wonderful sessions. Uh, we're gonna go into a practical session here on follow-up for differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, and I will be presenting some patient cases to our wonderful panel, which is comprised of Chris McCabe from the University of Birmingham, UK, who's our basic and translational scientist and gonna be able to help us maybe with some of the uh, uh, deeper questions of sort of some of the monitoring and why and what we consider in these patients. Uh, we also have Cosimo Durante here from the University of Rome Sapienza, so he didn't have to come terribly far uh, for this wonderful panel. And Giuseppe Barbasino from Harvard, uh, the MGH in Boston. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, begin these uh, patient presentations. And I have four scenarios. I, we likely, likely will only get to three, but the last one is how do we monitor patients with bone metastases? So I think the first three are gonna be more common and, and some of the questions that we have here. I also will move through certain parts of these, especially the beginning fairly quickly, and we won't get tied down into uh, some of the initial therapy uh, because I wanna talk about monitoring. So our first patient is a 43-year-old male who had a carotid ultrasound as part of an executive health workup that we have at the University of Colorado for hypertension. Um, so one of the things they do that's so wonderful for my practice is do a carotid ultrasound that also accidentally looks at the thyroid. So his carotid arteries were fine, but he had a 1.4 centimeter left inferior thyroid nodule that was noted. His TSH was normal at 1.23. Here's the ultrasound, and again, we won't go into many of these, many of our panelists could go into a lot of details on this, but he has this inferior isoechoic, probably what we consider a low sonographic risk uh, nodule, but that's 1.4 centimeters. This was biopsied and is a Herthel cell neoplasm. And so because it was a Herthel cell neoplasm, uh, the patient was at the time sent for surgery, and the patient had a left lobectomy. So now it's had half his thyroid removed, the other part looked normal, and it turns out to be a minimally invasive Herthel cell carcinoma, right? Freaks us all out that this is a Herthel cell carcinoma. What are we gonna do about a patient with a Herthel cell carcinoma? And I guess I'd like to start with Chris on asking him about sort of our understanding with this new information on the genetics and genomics and, and, uh, of Herthel cell cancer um, and how that might help inform us on monitoring and or management of these patients. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I think as part of the Admiral um, diversity and inclusion policy of this wonderful conference, uh, they've got a minority scientist to um, uh, speculate on um, some issues, uh, so please forgive me. Um, no, I think this is a, a really interesting case, and there were two really fantastic uh, publications last year published simultaneously in Cancer Cell from Boston and from the Memorial Sloan Kettering. And they sequenced a good number of, of Hurtle cell carcinomas. And um, really they confirmed what people had always felt, that there were mitochondrial abnormalities, mutations in mitochondrial genes, um, the gain and loss of lots of uh, whole chromosomes, and also the usual suspects of p53 mutations and RAS, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the, the picture in, in Hurtle cell is, is really interesting because it's so genetically unstable by losing whole chromosomes. I suppose you make any prognostic information very difficult to get at because it's a very genetically noisy background if you compare it, for example, with papillary thyroid cancer, which is genetically uh, very straightforward. So I think in answer really to, your, to, your, to your point, Brian, I mean... Um, Yes, sequencing is, is really useful and, and would be in this patient, but it's not necessarily that straightforward because of the, the huge amount of genetic noise that you would have there. Good, thank you. And, and Cosimo or Giuseppe, uh, is there a difference here when you look at a tumor like this, it's minimally invasive, and they say it has capsular invasion and not vascular invasion. Does that help your level of concern adjust that? Sorry, okay. Uh, no, no concern. I mean, uh, if I have a, a cancer classified as a minimal invasive with capsular invasion but without vascular invasion, uh, I think uh, this kind of cancer can be managed like a low-risk cancer. What is important uh, 
in the clinical practice, in the real life, is uh, to be sure about this uh, report. Uh, so uh, several times if uh, we receive uh, this kind of reports, not from a uh, referral center, we will prefer to ask uh, for uh, reviewing the histology report in order to be sure about this diagnosis. If we confirm this kind of diagnosis, uh, we are confident in considering this, this uh, cancer uh, as a low-risk uh, cancer. Giuseppe? Any? Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I would add that uh, if this patient was uh, operated uh, uh, greater, uh, earlier than say, six months ago or sooner than six months ago, you wouldn't need to add the capsular, not vascular, because with the newest uh, WHO classification of follicular cancer and hertel cell cancers, minimal invasive really means only capsular invasion, and that's probably the lowest risk feature. As you can see in this patient, I would also add that uh, I still worry about hurtle cell cancers. The old, most of the statistics that we have from years back, they tend to accumulate hurtle cell together with follicular cancer, but we now know, especially uh, thanks to the molecular data that we have now, that those are very different types of cancer. And they are different in the uh, clinical behavior as well as hurtle cell cancer has the distinct capacity of metastasizing to lymph nodes, which follicular cancer doesn't. But this tumor clearly has a low risk for doing so because of the only capsular invasion, but also because of the small size of the tumor that uh, it still remains an anatomic feature that has probably the greatest importance in determining the prognosis. So I would agree that uh, a left lobectomy on my mind would be adequate treatment for this patient. Okay. And so again, we see here, this is a minimally invasive herthel cell carcinoma. Preoperatively, we see the TSH. Postoperatively, it's gone up a little bit, but it's 1.8. The thyroglobulin postoperatively is 18. So that's terrible, right? Because that's well above one. Um, and, and so the questions I guess I have uh, are, anyone, would anyone recommend levothyroxine for this patient as a therapy? And how do we approach monitoring? And I guess I'll start with Giuseppe here. You know, would you offer this patient levothyroxine? Why or why not? And wh what would you set for an initial monitoring plan for this patient? I assume, I guess, that no one would want to do a completion thyroidectomy. Is that right? Yeah, okay. I wouldn't. Right. Okay. Yes. So how, what would you do for levothyroxine and monitoring, Giuseppe? Well, I would tell them that uh, that thyroglobulin doesn't tell me a lot because a person who has an entire lobe is entitled to have a thyroglobulin of 18, and I would like to know whether there are nodules on the other side that may even justify that more. But it does um, uh, happen to be quite variable in people who have had a lobectomy to have a thyroglobulin that is detectable, and I would talk to them about the possibility of suppressing that with um, levothyroxine with the goal of uh, easing the follow-up. And in a patient who is 43, maybe that's something that is worthwhile doing. But uh, to be honest, there isn't a lot of data that suggests that that uh, procedure improves outcome, definitely. And so I would have a conversation with the patient. And uh, if uh, he were to be amenable, I would probably go on levothyroxine and monitor the thyroglobulin afterward just as a measure of safety. As I said, these are the cancers I worry the most after a lobectomy, the hurtle cells more than the follicular, just because they tend to be slightly more aggressive and we've had surprises with those. Mm -hmm. And what, 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 what would you set follow-up? Would you say go away, never come back, come back in two months for a... Well, I would scan or what so would I would you repeat, recommend? I would repeat the blood test um, after a while and uh, maybe two or three months to make sure the TSH goes down a little bit. I wouldn't uh, suppress it to zero, but I would repeat that afterwards and see the thyroglobulin going down. And certainly I would monitor these patients with a low cost and low invasive technique as a neck ultrasound every year for a while. Okay. And Cosimo, would you give levothyroxine and how would you monitor? Uh, well, I think uh, there, are, there is not enough evidence in this field, so actually my approach will be uh, different. Uh, I, I would avoid levothyroxine uh, treatment in this patient. Uh, I will uh, uh, follow this patient if I will see an increase of the TSH over time, and maybe I will consider to introduce uh, levothyroxine in a second uh, time. But at the beginning, uh, I will leave the TSH like this without levothyroxine treatment. As for the monitoring program, uh, uh, I think uh, one single value of thyroglobulin here is not enough uh, to classify this patient as a, as a patient with a suspicion of residual uh, uh, disease. I think we need uh, to observe uh, the trend of the thyroglobulin 
over time. So for sure, I would uh, like to, to see at least another follow-up uh, visit, uh, uh, maybe in, in six months. And uh, I will also include the neck uh, ultrasound because we know the heart cell in up to 30% of the patient may have also uh, neck lymph node involvement. Okay. Well, we know that uh, from the uh, 2015 guidelines, one recommendation is for low-risk patients, which we believe this patient would be in, who have undergone a lobectomy, TSH may be maintained in that lower end of the reference range. There's not evidence that aggressively suppressing it is going to really change outcome. So thyroid hormone therapy may not be needed. If with a lobe alone, a patient can uh, maintain a TSH in that target range, you do see that this is a weak recommendation based on low-quality evidence. I think we need more evidence um, in this area to help us. Um, this is, again, a, tar a, a table that was in the guidelines uh, looking at TSH suppression. And really, on the uh, left-hand column is the increasing risk of TSH suppression versus the risk of a patient having persistent or recurrent disease based on response to therapy, excellent, indeterminate, biochemical incomplete, and st structural incomplete. And one thing we struggle with, I think, a lot in patients, or I think a lot of people do, is to say, a patient like this who's had a lobectomy, how do we put them into one of these categories? Because these categories were defined based on a thyroidectomy and radioiodine for the most part. Um, and so there has been some data, and this is a data out of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and also Brazil, uh, Rio de Janeiro, where they looked um, at a number of patients, and 7.5% uh, of these patients did have N1 disease. They're fairly low risk, but 15% were ATA intermediate risk. And they asked the question of where should we put an excellent versus an indeterminate response. And I'll, just I'll show you on the far right side here with lobectomy, is for a patient who's had a lobectomy, an excellent response would be a stable, non-stimulated thyroglobulin less than 30. And I think I've asked Mike this before, and he says, we just made that number up. Okay, that's true. Um, and so, it, I mean, it makes sense based on if you have a normal TSH and if a full thyroid's in, you're up to 60, this is up to 30. Um, and then just non-specific findings on imaging or having antibodies, which this patient didn't have. So technically, this patient with a lobectomy would meet an excellent response to therapy. Um, so we can do that. We can estimate these. We need more data, but we can estimate these for patients with a lobectomy alone. So when, when we get the I think with a number of people out there who don't treat a lot of these patients, they say, how can I follow a patient after a lobectomy who's had cancer? We can. And like our panel said, is with following TSH, we can use thyroglobulin, knowing it's not perfect in somebody who has a lobe, but ultrasound is also very helpful. Uh, and I'll go past this. Um, so we had this uh, uh, six-month follow-up now on this patient. TSH is actually leveled out at 1.75, so it's not rising. Thyroglobulin is 17, so that's not rising. And the neck ultrasound is negative. So I guess my question, maybe starting again with Cosimo, is what type of a monitoring plan would you set up in this patient now? Is this a patient that can be referred back to someone? Do they need to come back every year for the rest of their life, knowing that there's probably no perfect answer for this? <laughs> Actually, there is no perfect answer to this question. Uh, what I will do, I will address uh, this patient to a uh, follow-up uh, every year, once a year. Uh, by uh, using only thyroglobulin. Uh, we had uh, the initial neck ultrasound that was uh, negative. So in this case, I'm confident in uh, following this patient only with thyroglobulin. If the thyroglobulin will be rising, in this case, I will uh, perform uh, some uh, imaging studies uh, of the neck, also uh, outside the neck. As for the setting of the follow-up, I have no definitive answer. Uh, maybe for this kind of cancer, there is uh, still no room uh, to ad address these patients uh, to the uh, general practitioner, but I will maintain follow-up in a, a center with specialized for this cancer because of the histologic diagnosis. Giuseppe, what would you? Well, yeah, you? I agree that um, it, it's hard to go wrong with this, but I do have an ultrasound in my office, and I see these patients for a little while, and I do the ultrasound to very little addition, additional time loss and very little additional costs because I do the ultrasound as part of the exam, and so I, I don't deny the exam to my patient. Yeah, and I think, I think we need more data in this area. 
Um, uh, obviously, again, uh, what we would consider, I've tried before some of these patients to send them back to a primary care, but if they have a diagnosis of cancer, the primary care doesn't want to touch them. Um, and so we, we, do, we would do probably a follow-up in a year. If that looks good, we may wait a few years, and maybe we'd consider stopping some of this routine follow-up at about five years. But we're all worried about those rare patients who come back with a distant metastasis, I think is what really drives us until we have better data on who we we can follow. I think, Cosimo, did you have another point you want to make? Yes, it's just about an echo ultrasound. I, I agree this is a powerful uh, tool in our hands, but uh, even in experienced uh, uh, sonographer, uh, we may also find uh, some uh, undeterminate findings in the neck. Uh, sometimes uh, these findings will be more an issue than, uh, um, than, than something useful for the, for yeah. the patient. So we have to keep in, to, in mind that uh, in most of the patients there are uh, uh, undetermined findings uh, we, that we should manage in, in these patients. Yeah, we need to do it ourselves and have g a good technique and low blood pressure when we follow these patients because we don't want to overly worry our patients or we want to use radiology that again can easily distinguish these normal looking and even indeterminate or non-specific lymph nodes without getting totally freaked out. I agree. And Chris, I guess the final question on this is, when do you think we're going to be routinely using molecular testing in a patient like this to help maybe risk stratify whether we should follow them more closely or not? Yeah, I mean, I think we're some way away from that. And I think the field is very embryonic at the moment. Uh, as I said, those two terrific papers really came out last year. Um, it's a rare cancer, and I guess to put together a big data set in the way that TCGA did for DCGA, excuse me, did for papillary thyroid cancer, uh, it is going to be a big undertaking. And again, I would come back to the issue. I think that these are so uh, genetically uh, diverse and noisy that um, even if you could see which mutations are in your uh, patient routinely the therapies are going to be difficult because they have mutations in lots of genes which are not that druggable, you know, P53, RAS, etc. So I, I think we're some way off it and we may never actually get there, it is my, my feeling. Okay, great, thank you. I'm going to go on to the next patient. So th that was our easy patient. And now I'll go on to the next patient who's a 51-year-old female who uh, had uh, what would originally have been in the seventh edition of our staging system, a stage three uh, follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer, but now in the eighth edition, as we've heard about from Mike and others, is it would be a stage one. She had multiple lymph nodes involved, so she's considered an in intermediate risk by the ATA classification. She, at the time, a, f a while ago is when this patient was first seen, received 100 millicuries of radioiodine. There was uptake in the thyroid bed region only, and she was followed yearly for two years with diagnostic whole body scans, something that was shown in St. Louis many years ago in a study um, about following patients. Um, and these were negative, so this all looks great. So she sees a different endocrinologist about five years after her initial diagnosis, and she has an overly suppressed T uh, TSH, I would think, for such seemingly non-aggressive disease, except her thyroglobulin is 8.2. Her neck ultrasound is negative, her diagnostic whole body scan is negative, um, and I guess the questions I have for the panel are, where do you think her disease is, if we believe this thyroglobulin, and which, which of these tests so far we're going to start in monitoring the thyroglobulin, neck ultrasound, and diagnostic whole body scan tend to be the most and least sensitive for detecting disease in patients with differentiated thyroid cancer? I guess I'll start with Giuseppe. Well, so you start to say if we believe this thyroglobulin, and this is kind of an aside, but I want to mention that occasionally thyroglobulin gives false positives. They're very rare, but when they happen, they are a damnation. And I found that there are two ways uh, to sort them out. I don't really know where they come from. It must be heterophilic antibodies or something, but there are two ways to find out whether that's a false positive. One is to use the, um, the mass spectrometry method that will avoid most of the interference from heterophilic antibodies. And the other is a stimulation with the TSH, whether recombinant or withdrawal, because those uh, artifacts in the test will not respond. And I have at least three or four patients who scare me with the thyroglobulin suddenly coming back positive, and when I went to scan them with recombinant human TSH, their thyroglobulin went from eight to eight, and that is where I thought maybe that's not right because it really seldom happens, but that's extremely rare. But uh, once said that, 
certainly uh, one would want to find the source of the pterogloban. And certainly in a patient like this, the most likely source is a lymph node in the neck. And we do love ultrasound, but there are areas in the neck that are not uh, really um, well analyzed with ultrasound. For example, in the in the esophageal groove or the parapharyngeal space. And sometimes, you know, I have to say it as a sonographer, but sometimes uh, well done next CT with contrast is a, a good step to start with. And to be honest, at that time, since I'm giving the patient contrast, I will often also get a chest CT to um, get the back from my money, as I would say. Okay. Cosimo, any addition? Uh, yes, I think in this case there is also room uh, for considering if you have access to this exam uh, to combine the CT scan with the uh, PET, uh, FDG PET scan. Okay. Uh, we, we know from uh, the literature that are, uh, the sensitivity of a PET scan in detecting uh, disease in patients with the biochemical evidence disease is uh, quite good, uh, especially for patients with heteroglobin levels uh, greater than 10, but also greater than five, according to more recent uh, reports. So maybe this could be an option. Uh, yeah. But I agree with him that uh, the, the most common site of this patient are the neck and the chest. So I will expect to find the disease uh, in these uh, sites. Yeah. And I've seen some literature where it even is as high as 30, where you get a cutoff of having a PET CT being very useful. So there's, there's, it seems like there's variation in the literature yeah. of a PET CT being useful. But I think my rule of thumb is if a suppressed TG is less than 10, you're, on le you're probably more likely to find nonspecific positive than you are specific positive in these patients. And so looking again at these three, thyroglobulin, neck ultrasound, and diagnostic whole body scan, the sensitivity for detection, we kind of know about the whole body scan. I think in the era, in the first two bars you see here from older studies that actually the uh, gold standard was high dose radioiodine. And so a low dose radioiodine scan is reasonable at predicting a high dose radioiodine scan. Um, but if you look at the green and purple bars, and then there's a red bar that's not even shown there, these are studies that began adding other tests, CT scans, PET scans, other things. The sensitivity of a diagnostic whole body scan is very low. The utility of a diagnostic whole body scan is to ask, can I give this patient more radioiodine? Not, do they have disease? A sensitive thyroglobulin, and this older slide talks about stimulated, but when we now have a more sensitive thyroglobulin, we don't really need to stimulate, can be quite good. But obviously, um, it can miss disease, especially in the presence of autoantibodies. Neck ultrasound is very good, because as our panelists said, this patient probably has disease in their neck. Um, and a neck ultrasound is very good, but again, not perfect, because it could be disease outside the neck, or as Cosimo said, deep, in the neck, low down, or very high up in the neck is where we miss it with ultrasound. So if we combine a sensitive thyroglobulin and an ultrasound in an antibody negative patient, that usually is sufficient in a majority of patients to find the disease. So this patient again had this follow up. What they decided to do was wait and watch to see what happens. So this is what happened six months later. TSH was still suppressed. Thyroglobulin has now gone from eight to 58. A chest CT and an XCT were done, which I think is very reasonable to look in this patient. Um, and now, now they're deciding to refer the patient. So the question is once, I guess again now, and I'll start with Cosimo this time, where do you think her disease is and what other tests, I guess you said we ought to get a PET scan, but what other tests would you get and where do you think her disease is? Now I, I agree that we need to perform the uh, PET scan with this uh, Thyroglobin levels, by considering the neck CT was negative, the chest CT was negative. Maybe we can, we can think about the, the bones. The bones are... Think about the bones as well. Would yeah. you give this patient a large dose of radioiodine? Because then it could also show us where the disease is and maybe treat it? Or no. does a negative whole body scan diagnostically dissuade you from doing that? Uh, no, I will not use uh, any uh, empiric uh, treatment with radioiodine. I would prefer first uh, to stage the, the patients before uh, choosing the, the right therapy for these uh, patients. And then how about as far as Chris, to increase, you know, in these patients, we have a lot of things that can increase. We know the patient has this disease somewhere, and it's probably some disease that could be treatable. You know, are there other ways we can find it, I guess, and maybe use NIST to our advantage, sodium iodide symporter? 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the big irony here is, of course, the, the big imaging gene that we have in thyroid cancer gets selectively lost as the tumour needs more therapy and needs more imaging uh, because NIS, the sodium iodide supporter, gets switched off. Um, and I think there is a role here uh, for trying to boost NIS expression and function, and I, I think it's something that isn't done clinically, but we do have drugs that can, in a subset of patients, very effectively switch NIS expression back on, things like selametinib, which maybe in half of patients can, can bring NIS uh, back into play. Um, my group is obsessed at the moment, my research group, um, with the trafficking of NIS, and we've developed a story where we've uh, actually mapped the trafficking of NIS, and we now have drugs which will push NIS uh, selectively to the plasma membrane, which is where it, it can be active in taking up radioactive iodide. So I think, yes, Brian, to, to, to address your point, I think we can, we do have the ability to give drugs to boost NIS, which might then give you enough sensitivity to see where exactly in the body uh, the, the actual tumours are. But I guess we're not doing that, but that might be something in the future. Good. Thank you. So the patient was referred, and it takes him a little while to get to the University of Colorado. So by the time that she got here, her suppressed thyroglobulin was now 148 with a negative antibody. So we did, we went back up, and what you do is repeat some of the studies. We did an echo ultrasound and actually found disease uh, in her right neck, just lateral to the carotid, some an irregular looking tumor uh, that was found, and we did a chest CT that actually found small, multiple small pulmonary metastases. Now, as Cosimo said, I looked at this thyroglobulin and I said, I don't know if this is all her disease, so we complemented that with a PET scan, and interestingly, the only thing that really lit up on her CT PET scan was this neck lesion, uh, a very PET positive neck lesion. So probably tells us back to Chris's point too, knowing the flip-flop phenomenon, that this lesion unli is unlikely to take up, even if we gave a large dose of radioiodine, unless we could give some sort of a redifferentiating agent or an agent to get NIS to the plasma membrane. So. Knowing this patient had small lung metastases, but a, a tumor that if it grew um, in that area, we sent her for surgery, and she had a right lateral neck dissection. Three out of 19 lymph nodes were positive. This one was 1.9 centimeters, extranodal extension, so it was being more aggressive, and there was just some microscopic positivity along the margins, but it was a gross total resection uh, that was uh, achieved in this patient. Six weeks post-op, we cured her, right? Her thyroglobulin is now higher. <laughs> so we did a really good job in this patient. Um, so she then got a I-123 whole body scan. What I tend to do, especially if we don't know where she's gotten it, did they appropriately prepare the patient? We put these patients on a strict two-week low iodine diet if we're going to do this. And then measure a urinary iodine, which was low in her. The diagnostic scan was negative. You see her thyroglobulin stimulated um, and with the TSH that she had there. So I guess the question, and maybe coming back to Giuseppe, is would you give this lady an empiric dose of radioiodine because she's got a positive thyroglobulin, what looks like small volume disease, we've now well prepared her with a low iodine diet, or would you do other imaging? Well, you have stimulated her already. I would have done some imaging before stimulating her with a concern of uh, metastatic disease in the central nervous system and uh, potentially causing dramatic uh, side effects. So I would have get, gotten an MRI of the head because I do believe that the disease is in the lungs, but I would be concerned about other locations that are not simply caught by a PET CT. So I would have done a brain MRI and probably would do it at this time before giving her radioactive iodine. The question whether to give radioactive iodine is a difficult one. I, but the bottom of my heart, I don't think radioactive iodine will do anything to this lady. But these uh, metastases that you've shown in the lung seems, uh, seem to be very small. And so probably below the detection of a PET CT and of a um, whole body scan if they're not dense enough to show up and, and be completely negative in terms of um, uh, uptake. If I can say something to the basic scientists in the in the room, we really need to have. If I had a, a, a you know a wish that I can get granted to have a test on the tissue that tells me which thyroid cancer is sensitive to radioactive iron and which one is not, 
Uh, we've had a lot of molecular biology advances, and we need to have that, because if I had that in my hands on a patient like this, even doing on the, on the uh, nodal metastasis it was removed, then that would be a, um, a major benefit. And, but in this case, I don't think it would give additional radioactive iodine. Chris? Um, as maybe the only basic scientist in the room, and I, I, this is probably the first time that's ever happened, I apologize if, if half of you are basic scientists, but I, I, I agree. I mean, I think we just about have the tools to be able to do that. If you can get to the metastasis, if you can get to the tumor, you can measure the NIS mRNA expression and, of course, the other genes, TPO and thyroglobulin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's more difficult is to know where NIS is in those cells. So if NIS is expressed, is it at the plasma membrane? And you can only do that, of course, through immunohistochemistry, and that's a little bit of an inact, inexact science. I, I think we, you know, most of the way there to be able to do that, but it's not easy, and I guess um, it probably it's not happening anywhere in the world, but I don't think it's unsolvable. Great, and so what we did, and I think Giuseppe makes a very good point, and this was a while ago, and something I think I would have done now with this high of a thyroglobulin, I've always, you know, obviously screened for neurologic symptoms in these patients, but we all know we can see patients who are completely asymptomatic. Usually they don't have large lesions, but we can run into trouble with thyroid hormone withdrawal or recombinant human TSH if in the CNS or axial spine they have lesions. So I think a lot of times we need to rule that out. This one, what we did was two things. One was measure a thyroglobulin by a different method. Because is, is there something weird about the thyroglobulin? Probably not because it's stimulated with TSH. But in a different method, the radioimmunoassay method, it's the same. An MRI of the brain was negative in this patient. And we went on to do both an MR skeletal survey and a bone scan. Um, in this patient that was negative. And I guess maybe Cosimo, you know, what do you prefer if you're screening the bones? If you're saying, I think this patient may have bone metastases, what test do you prefer for screening the bones? Uh, for screening the bone, I prefer the MRI. Uh, I, I, even if the bone scan has a, a really good sensitivity, but uh, uh, for, for screening, in order to be, to, to, uh, in the meantime, to identify the lesions, also to stage, these lesions, I would prefer MRI. MRI? Yeah. Okay. And so again, I guess especially to Cosimo and Giuseppe, would you now give this patient radioiodine or just watch them? I will give uh, radioiodine. How I much? These patients. Uh, I, I, therapeutic dose, uh, so over uh, 100. Over 100? Uh, over 100, Giuseppe, yes. would you give radioiodine? So um, when you did the whole body scan, that was done prior to the removal of the lymph node, right? No, after. After, so uh, we don't know, because that, would, that node would be a, a very nice bulb to tell us whether this uh, tumor is uh, radioactive iodine sensitive or not. So we had and that tumor, that, that tumor had a high SUV on PET scan, so yeah. unlikely to be concentrating radioiodine. See, so the... the, the it was pa papillary thyroid cancer was a histopathology was the question. Yeah, follicular variant. No, the question was it wasn't de-differentiated. No, it was papillary thyroid cancer. So I guess my answer to the patient would be, well, I doubt that this will do anything, but what else can I do for you? <laughs> and so... I want to sleep at night. <laughs> no, I want you to sleep at I night. Want you but, <laughs> with a dry so, mouth. <laughs> and so I, you know, we would say with turning my head back, I would say maybe I'll give you a dose of radioactive G iodine. Give you to, some to radioactive close, To close the issue once and forever for you. <laughs> Furio, would you give radio iodine to this patient? Of course. Of course, Dr. Pacini would give it. So we, we gave radio iodine to this patient, 200 millicuries. So we gave her a dry mouth. Um, but she did have uptake in her liver. She didn't have uptake in the lungs for these pulmonary lesions, but there was some uptake in the liver. Um, so does that mean that she actually concentrated some, made some radioactive thyroglobulin, and it was cleared in the liver? So we, maybe we did something for this patient other than give her a dry mouth. So we then followed her with these pulmonary metastases, and now I've got this resist measurement below. We had a few of our target lesions, and together they were very, these are very small lesions that wouldn't even make it for a clinical trial yet, but she went up to resist of 11 millimeters. Her thyroglobulin kept rising, so I don't, I've heard Furio talk before about if we can at least stabilize it in some patients with radioiodine. I don't know if we really achieve that result um, in this patient. She has small volume, progressive disease. And here's what we see again, thyroglobulin rising, resist measurements rising, but slowly. 
and still small volume disease in this patient. So is, other than close monitoring at this point, Cosimo, would you do anything else for this patient? I mean, I think, I like Chris's point, maybe what I should have done was thought about trametinib or selumetinib off-label or putting this patient, I don't know if there was a clinical trial at this time for that. Maybe your selumetinib trial was open then. Yeah. So Cosimo, would anything else you'd offer for this patient? Uh, I think the, 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 the disease uh, is a, a minimal disease. We see the lesions are uh, tiny lesions in the, in the lungs. So uh, initiating now the uh, systemic therapy will expose the patients to a significant toxicity uh, likely to an impairment of the quality of life. So uh, in, this patient, in this case, uh, uh, probably I will closely monitor the patients. Giuseppe, same? Would you closely well, monitor? At, at the moment, I wouldn't have anything to add, but I would say that um, it seems to me that she has a teroglobulin doubling time, if I can make the calculation, about seven months, which is quite concerning. And uh, so I wouldn't do anything actively because we don't have anything that is uh, clinically recommended at this time. But I would um, certainly obtain the tissue for a molecular analysis to be prepared for a targeted therapy in the future that unfortunately may not be so far for this patient. Okay. And this is, she actually had a second opinion somewhere else outside tumor board, said consider starting a multikinase inhibitor, which I think many of us in this room in this patient would not at this point because this is not large enough volume or rapidly progressing or symptomatic disease. And as I tell my patients, the only thing I can guarantee them, if I put them on a multikinase inhibitor, I will give them symptoms. This patient otherwise feels well now. So I, I agree with the panel. Um, and this just again shows what do we do with patients who have radioiodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer, and these were some relatively new recommendations, now in not so new of guidelines. New guidelines are being worked on now, but monitoring, directed therapy, systemic therapy, and clinical trials, what we've talked about. And so this is um, the most recent on this patient uh, was, again, a thyroid globulin now over 1,000, really has continuing progressive, getting to be larger volume, but still relatively small volume disease. And I think, as Giuseppe pointed out, in some of these patients, what we tend to do is try to biopsy the largest lesion um, for two reasons. One, make sure that it's still the same cancer we think it is. I've actually picked up primary lung cancer in the background of uh, differentiated thyroid cancer, and also a transformation to a more poorly differentiated or anaplastic. So this was biopsied and was still the papillary thyroid cancer. It was not poorly differentiated, was not anaplastic, and uh, molecular testing on this showed it was BRAF and TERT, which tells us even though it was a follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer, that this is, it, once, wonderfully, we're going to say this, this is likely going to behave aggressively as, as it's doing. So the molecular has told us sort of what we already know. I guess, you know, for anybody on the panel, would you consider a, a BRAF-directed therapy in this patient? Likely in the setting of a clinical trial, since we don't have anything approved. Would you consider that in this patient? I would consider it in a setting of a clinical trial, not as a... Um compassionate use, that would be the only other alternative that we would have because we don't have enough data in a tumor that, while being poorly differentiated, is not an anaplastic cancer and therefore is outside the recognized uh, indications. And we know so far that in differentiated thyroid cancer, even the combination of a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor, it's not, it doesn't seem to be as striking as it is with anaplastic thyroid cancer. is rising and you can't do anything for her? Exactly. No. Um, <laughs> no. I, I mean, what we're talking, when we, when we see the patient with this, is I, tell, I actually show the patients their scans. I okay. go over the scans with the patients and I say, look, you've got lots of normal lung. You have these small tumors that are definitely growing, so we're concerned. And if we had something we could easily offer you that would cause no side effects, we would definitely do it right now. But we need, to con we need to monitor, to watch you closely. The patient feels perfectly fine as asymptomatic. So at this point, I'm letting her know that this is concerning, that her tumor marker's going up, that her tumor's growing. But I think sometimes we get concerned and feel like we need to do something. And the something we do could harm the patient more than help them in some of these circumstances. Thank you. So again, asymptomatic. And again, the options we have, which we talked about, uh, were these various options in these patients. And this patient actually ended up continuing to progress and more recently has been put on lenvatinib um, therapy.
is, is being begun lenvatinib therapy. But again, Chris's point and the other's point about considering maybe a clinical trial with something to redifferentiate so that you could get radioiodine. Because once these tumors get large enough, they're heterogeneous enough, that even if you can get some radioiodine in, you might not have a very good effect on the complete tumor. Uh, Brian, can I just ask, so why did she go on to lenvatinib rather than dibrafenib and, and an anesthetic MEK inhibitor, for example? Um, well, she could have gone on a trial for that. I, I think the data are not such that the a dibrafenib plus a MEK inhibitor in differentiated thyroid cancer like this is nearly as effective as we see in anaplastic thyroid cancer. All right, so in the remaining few minutes, I'm going to go, I told you I wouldn't get to the fourth patient. We're not even going to hardly get through the third patient. This is a 40-year-old female, but we've had a good discussion. With a near total thyroidectomy, 2.5 centimeter papillary, 6 out of 10 lymph nodes positive, so a stage 1 patient, ATA, again, kind of barely into that intermediate risk. Anything up until uh, widely metastatic disease for Dr. Tuttle is considered low risk. Um, so postoperatively, here we have um, uh, mildly suppressed TSH, and again, this was a while ago, so the cutoff for the assay was 0.5, an undetectable thyroglobulin. So I guess briefly, would Giuseppe and Cosimo, would you offer this patient radioiodine? Uh, in the absence of evidence of disease, uh, I will just follow these patients without uh, giving radioiodine. Okay. Giuseppe? If I had to follow the American Thyroid Association guidelines... Yes, you have to follow them. <laughs> <laughs> then it depends on the... Well, the number of the lymph nodes is already sufficient to recommend radioactive iodine. Okay. So low dose, maybe? Well, yeah. here's, here's the other confounding factor. Patient has positive antibodies. Mm. And this is what some people think about when they get a patient with positive antibodies. You know, now what, and does that change your thinking about radioiodine in this patient to make it easier potentially to follow? Well, it's a double-edged sword because um, I tell them, you know, ablation is useless because I cannot use thyroglobulin anyways. So the, one of the goals of radioactive iodine, which is to use thyroglobulin, now I don't have it anymore. But on the other hand, when I tell them, you know, I don't know, I'm not going to know what your thyroglobulin is, they're going to say, well, let's do the most to make sure it's zero even without, we don't know. And so, but no, it doesn't change the decision. Okay. Can I add something? I think uh, we have no rush in this decision. So we can also wait, uh, as we have just one assay of the thyroglobulin antibodies, uh, we can also wait for the trend of uh, thyroglobulin antibodies. Uh, we can also decide to treat with this patient with radioiodine and later on. Uh, right. That's a change uh, the outcome of our patient. Okay, Chris, did yeah. you know? I, I just wanted to add, Brian, I mean, you know, all of this to me illustrates the point that we need new mod modalities for monitoring thyroid cancer um, because what we have is not perfect um, by any means. There's been a lot of study on um, cell-free DNA uh, of uh, extracellular vesicles, of microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs and even, uh, you know, uh, cancer cells which are circulating, you know, circulating tumor cells. None of those are perfect, and, and, and my group did a, a systematic review of those last year. Um, but there is some uh, possibility, I think, in the future to maybe refine the technologies and to combine with what we know are the genetic drivers and to provide a, you know, another way of monitoring patients such as this for whom it's very difficult to know what's going on and, and, and uh, you know, uh, where you can't really trust the thyroglobulin. Yeah, very, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. So again, I'll just briefly go through this. The general population, we do see thyro uh, thyroid autoantibodies, more thyroid peroxidase than thyroglobulin. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's almost a diagnostic procedure, common in Graves' disease. And actually, we know that 20 to 30% of our patients with differentiated thyroid cancer will have these autoantibodies. Um, and again, I think Carol Spencer and others have really helped us with this. One thing we need to do is, obviously, I think we in this room kind of know this, but the what, what is what's called the manufacturer cutoff, that is to predict autoimmune thyroid disease. That is not to say whether you have or do not have um, autoantibodies. The cutoff in this assay that we had was 60. It doesn't mean below 60 the antibodies are negative. That's called the manufacturer cutoff. What we need to look at for our patients is the functional sensitivity, the level, the lowest level they'll give us. In this case, in this assay, it's 20. So if you have somebody who has 40 and it says less than 60, it doesn't mean they don't have autoantibodies. It just means they're less predictive of autoimmune thyroid disease. And I think, again, Carol showed nicely that when she took Sera from 144 patients who had in this Cronus assay positive autoantibodies, and MCO is the manufacturer cutoff, 
And um, functional sensitivity is what we just talked about. Depending upon your assay, they're very different. And there are many assays that will actually be negative and you still have autoantibodies, which is really a discerning fact when we have a patient. This is where we have a patient we think is higher risk and they've got a completely negative thyroglobulin. We ought to be thinking about maybe other assays for that patient. And I'll just go through this very briefly to finish up on this patient. And recommend, oh, this is one thing I, I was going to say. This is what it says in the guidelines. We shouldn't routinely do preoperative. I do preoperative. I don't read our own guidelines. Um, <laughs> I think it's actually helpful to do preoperative to see if they have the autoantibodies because as very nicely um, Ver, uh, Verberg and colleagues said that this could be a kind of an in vivo recovery assay. Because if you preoperatively, with a patient with a known thyroid cancer, get a thyroglobulin, the antibodies are positive, and the thyroglobulin is undetectable, you know there's interfering antibodies. So I think it's a very helpful test to get preoperatively um, on these patients to look, do they have autoantibodies, and is the thyroglobulin going to be a reasonable tumor marker? So don't read the guidelines. <laughs> So she got 75 millicuries, and I'll just kind of go briefly through her. She had a whole body scan that was negative, antibodies were coming down, and then what I wanted to talk about a little bit more, and I won't now, but is these other assays that we can use, the radioimmunoassay, the um, LC mass spec assay. I, we don't usually recommend recovery assays, but I know some people use them, but I think the predictability is not great um, in those assays. And then as Chris mentioned, other markers hopefully that we'll have in the future, because these are common patients that we see. Um, so with that, I'd like to th very much thank our panel and thank you all for attending and let you get on to your break. <laughs> <laughs>